Hello and welcome back to the Consistia the Kirk YouTube channel. I'm your host for this video, Reverend Jake Zabel, the St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church, located in Dolby, Queensland, Australia. Today, we're continuing my What It Means to Be a Lutheran lecture series by going through Article 18 of the Augsburg Confession on the topic of free will. Luther wrote a small, well, not a small book, a well-known book, called The Bondage of the Will, in which he explains how the human will is bound to sin and that we cannot save ourselves. As Luther taught in the small catechism, I cannot come to God or believe in Him by my own reason, will or strength, but only by the power of the Holy Spirit, who enlightens and enlivens faith within me. Scripture teaches us that without the Holy Spirit, we are slaves to sin, see Romans 6.6, 6. enemies of God, see Romans 5.10, and we are dead in our trespasses, see Ephesians 2.1. Our will is born in bondage to sin, and we cannot do anything to earn the favour of God or to save ourselves. But our belief in the bondage of the will does not mean that we reject the doctrine of free will. Our will may be bound to commit sin, but this does not mean that our will is not free. On the contrary, we believe that humans freely choose to do this or that sin. If you commit a sin, then you have done so by your own free will and decision to commit that sin. We need to avoid the error of the puppet master God who controls every aspect of our life. For if God were a puppet master who directed each and every action we did, then God would be the one directing us to commit sin. And that is just nonsensical. Sin is going against the will of God. Thus, if a person commits a sin, this must stem from their own free will and not from the will of God. The bondage of the will does not undo the freedom of the will. Humans are free-thinking creatures. We have a free will to choose this or that. But when we say that the will is bound, we do not mean that we have no choice in the matter. What we mean is that the human will is completely and utterly corrupted by original sin. So that the will is bound to desire sinful things. But this bondage to commit sinful acts does not take place does not take away your free choice in the matter. To explain this in a simple way, the human will is bound to sin. We are slaves to sin and thus we, ha we all have sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. However, not every person commits the same sin, nor does a person commit every sin. As Melanchthon says in the Augsburg Confession, your free will can keep your hands from committing theft or murder. For example, the rich young ruler did not commit murder, nor adultery, nor theft. That was not his sin. His sin was greed. His free will, his human will, was free to commit this or that sin, but his will was still bound to commit a sin. Likewise, the human will can choose to do good works. Jesus tells us that even unbelievers can love their neighbours and even the wicked know how to give good gifts to their children. Even without the Holy Spirit, humans can do good works. But without the Holy Spirit, these are not pleasing to God. Hebrews 11.6 says that, that, which, that without faith it is impossible to please God. And in Romans 14.23, Paul says that that which does not proceed from faith is sin. So here we draw the distinction between civil righteousness and spiritual righteousness. The former, that is civil righteousness, is a righteousness that avails the world. Here a person is considered righteous if they do a lot of good things before other people. The latter, that is spiritual righteousness, that is that which avails before God. Here a person is only considered righteous by grace through faith in Christ. The human will is free to do this or that particular work, but we are not able to please God. We humans are free to choose not to do this sin or that sin, but we are not able to choose to not sin. Likewise, we are free to choose this work or that work, but we are not able to choose to do good works before God. It is only 
by the power of the Holy Spirit working faith within us that we are declared righteous before God. And it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us to sanctify us that our good works will be counted as good before God. Concerning the doctrine of the free will, the Augsburg Confession quotes St. Augustine, who taught that we confess that we have a will free, in, that there is a free will in all human beings. However, this free will only pertains to matters of the world and not to matters of God. Humans are free, but only in regards to things on our own level. We can choose to work or to be lazy. We can choose to eat, drink or not. We can choose to sleep or to not sleep. We can choose to visit a friend or to not visit them. We can choose to get dressed or to not get dressed. We can choose whether we eat this food or that food, whether we sleep here or there, whether we wear this shirt or that shirt. We are free to build a home, to get married, to engage in trade, etc. As Augustine taught, within this realm, you have freedom. But you do not have freedom in things that are above you. You cannot choose to fear, love, or believe in God, for as Luther wrote in his commentary on Genesis, we indeed have free will in things that are under us. For God has made us masters of the fowl in the air and the animals on the earth. But in all matters that pertain to God and are above us, man has no free will. We have a free will, but our freedom is limited by our abilities. If I come to a river, I can choose how I cross it. I can choose to try and swim across it. I can choose to try and boat across it. But I cannot choose to flap my wings and fly over it because I do not have the ability to fly. And so it is when it comes with loving God, with our whole mind, body, heart and soul. We do not possess the ability to do so. We have a free will, but we do not possess the ability to believe in God. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, those who are natural do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit. And Melanchthon explains this text in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, teaching that those who use only their natural powers do not perceive the things which are of God. When we discuss the second article of the Augsburg Confession concerning the doctrine of original sin, we explained how original sin is a disease that has totally corrupted the entire human being, so that we are all born full of evil lusts and inclinations, and that we cannot by nature possess a true fear of God or a true faith in God. So, we are here discussing the human will. And we must draw a distinction between the civil realm in which we are free to do as we please versus the spiritual realm in which our will is bound to sin and turn away from God and that it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that the human is able to come to God. See, when discussing the human will, we need to avoid the error of the puppet master God in that humans have absolutely no will. But at the same time, we need to avoid the error of the clockmaker God, which is the situation in which God simply creates the universe and just lets it run without ever interacting with it. In the Roman Confutation, the Catholics confessed their agreement with the Lutheran position and how we must take a middle way between the errors of the Pelagians, who ascribe too much to the freedom of the will, and the Manichaeans, who deny that man has any free will whatsoever. Although, in response to this, the Lutherans accused the Catholics of being no different to the Pelagians. In fact, we call the Catholics semi-Pelagians. For, as Melanchthon said, the Catholics believe that people can obey the law of God without the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit is given to them out of regard for the merit of this obedience. The Lutherans and the Catholics agree that humans possess a free will to do this or that good work, while also avoiding this or that sin. 
both reject the full-on Pelagian error that man has his own free will to be able to fulfill the law of God and that he could choose to never sin. Both error, both the Lutherans and the Catholics reject this error, that good works without faith are pleasing to God. However, where the Lutherans and the Catholic differ is on the reason why these works are not pleasing to God. This disagreement then forms the foundation for the differing views of salvation by faith alone versus salvation by faith and works. See, the Lutherans held that without the Holy Spirit, man's will is bound to sin. The unbeliever might be able to perform a good deed, but it will only be considered so in the civil realm. Such a deed does not stem from a true love, fear, and faith in God, and such a deed stems from a selfish preservation. However, the Roman Catholics via the scholastic theologians John Scotus and Gabriel Beale taught that a person without the Holy Spirit could love God and keep his commandments according to the substance of the act. They taught that humans had the innate ability to fulfill the divine commands of the law according to the letter of the law, but not according to the attention, the intention of the law, or the spirit of the law. Humans could keep the law of God by their own free will, but they required the infused grace of God in order for those works to merit the goodness and righteousness before God. Without grace, these deeds are not pleasing to God. But a person would receive the grace of God through the doing of these deeds, said the Catholics. This is best understood when we consider the Roman Catholic's view of how the sacraments worked. See, the Roman Catholics believed the sacraments worked ex opere operato, that a person could merit the grace of God simply through the performing of the sacraments. Regardless of your faith, regardless of repentance, as long as you did the sacrament, you would receive God's grace. The Catholic idea was that the person can obey the law of God without the Holy Spirit, and that it is through this obedience that the Holy Spirit is then merited to them. This was the Catholic explanation of why some and not others. For this is the great mystery of of salvation, the the crux of the theo the cross of the theologian, understanding this great mystery as to why not all go to heaven when God wants all people to go to heaven, and that those who go to heaven go there because God elected them. See, as Lutherans, we acknowledge that there are four scriptural truths that seem to conflict with one another. The first truth is that God desires all people to be saved. The second truth is that not all people are saved. The third truth is that those who are saved are elected by God and not by their own choice. And the fourth truth is that God does not elect anyone unto damnation and that ever anyone who is damned is there by their own free choice. This however, seems irrational. It seems illogical. It does not make sense to our human mind. If God desires all people to be saved, and those who are saved are chosen by God, then why are not all saved? If those who are saved are chosen by God, and not all are saved, then does this mean that God chose to damn those who weren't saved? These four scriptural truths seem to contradict one another, and our human mind cannot comprehend this. We Lutherans simply confess that this is the truth because this is what is revealed to us in scripture, and how we are to understand it is a great mystery that only God knows and can explain. However, many humans have sought to rectify this contradicting facts and provide their own explanation to how it worked. In doing this, they tend to do away with one or more of the truths. The Universalists believe that all people are saved, and thus they deny the second truth that not all are saved. The Calvinists believe in double predestination and limited atonement, 
And so they deny that God desires all to be saved, and they deny that God does not elect people unto damnation. Therefore, they deny the first and the fourth truth. The Arminians believe in a decision theology, that man can choose to be saved, and thus they deny the third truth, that those who are saved are elected by God, not by their own choice. And the Roman Catholics are also semi-Pelagians like the Arminians, and so they deny that man cannot choose to be saved. The Pelagians taught that man could fulfill the law by his own free will and thus earn his salvation. The Roman Catholics took a softer approach. As Melanchthon said in the Apology, the Catholics reject Pelagianism, but what really is the difference between what the Pelagians taught and what the Catholics teach? For the Roman Catholics, faith is not a gift of the Holy Spirit, which passively receives grace. Instead, faith is merely the desire to be saved. Faith is the force that compels the person to do the good work, and then it is the doing of that good work that earns them grace before God. For Rome, it doesn't matter whether you believe that Jesus is your saviour, for Rome, faith is simply the desire to not go to hell. For the Roman Catholics, they are not full Pelagians, for they do not believe a person can perfectly keep the law, but they do believe that a person can choose to want to obey God. And it is that desire to do the good works that earns the grace before God. It is that wanting to be better. For the Catholics, it's the do your best and God will do the rest idea. For the Catholics, faith is not a belief that Jesus has redeemed you. For the Catholics, faith is the belief that you just want to be saved. That you want to do God's law. That you want to go to heaven. For the Roman Catholics, faith is not faith in the Saviour. It is faith in the Judge. Rome believes in the wrathful God who wants to punish us for our sins. They do not believe in a merciful God. For Rome, the unbeliever is the person who does not believe God is angry with them. Hence, while at the ca hence why at the Council of Trent, the Roman Catholics condemned those who believed they were justified by grace alone through faith alone. For Rome, the believer is someone who fears the judgment of God and who is compelled by that fear to strive after holiness lest they be condemned. This striving after holiness, this love of God and his commandments, then rewards, is then earns you grace before God and God rewards you by giving you his Holy Spirit. So even though the Catholics condemn Pelagius, they still essentially believe that human beings, apart from the Holy Spirit, can choose to love, fear, and obey God. It is that God then looks upon that obedience and rewards them with saving grace. Likewise, the Armenians condemn the Catholics, but they are no different either. The Roman Catholics think that as long as you do your best, God will do the rest. They believe that humans have to climb up the ladder to heaven, but that if you can't make it all the way to the top, as long as you can do your best, Christ will meet you midway and take you the rest of the way. As for the Armenians, they are no different. The Armenians claim to believe in justification by grace through faith in Christ, but for the Armenians, faith is not the work of the Holy Spirit allowing you to passively receive God's grace. For the Armenians, faith is the active work of the believer to choose Christ and to receive him into your heart. The Armenians leave the work of the law to Christ, but they believe that a person must choose God, that you must make a decision for God, that you must accept Christ into your heart. In this way, the Armenians are also semi-Pelagians, and they are essentially no different to the Roman Catholics. The Armenians think that people can, by their own free will, make a decision for Christ. 
They can't save themselves. Christ has to do that. But they need to, they need to at least choose Christ and ask him to save them. But as the scriptures teach us, without the Holy Spirit, we are dead in our trespasses. And a dead corpse cannot choose it to be made alive. We are slaves to sin. We cannot choose to be set free. We are enemies of God. We do not choose Him. We hate Him by nature. Our will is bound to reject God. Our will does not choose God. We cannot, by our own reason, will, or strength, choose God or come to Him. It is He who must come to us. It is His Spirit that awakens faith within us. We must be made alive. We must be set free. We must be born again as children of God. As Arminians say that you make the decision and then the Holy Spirit will come to you. But we Lutherans say that the Holy Spirit comes to us first and then through the power of the Holy Spirit do we make the decision. But even then, it is not us who makes this decision by our own free will, but only by the power of the Holy Spirit who works within us. For even after conversion, the human will is still in opposition to God. We are always seeking to turn away from God. In Galatians 5.17, St. Paul writes, The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. In Romans 7, 19 and 23, Paul writes that the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I do not will to do, that is what I do. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Peter warns us to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us that we have the faith in God that receives His grace. We cannot do anything for our own salvation. If salvation were a ladder, the Pelagians are those who believe you can climb yourself into heaven. The Catholics believe that you must climb as high as you can go and that Jesus will meet you halfway and do the rest. The Arminians believe that Christ comes down to pick you up and carry up the ladder, but that you need to at least be on the ladder so that he can grab you. We Lutherans believe that we are lying dead at the bottom of the ladder. And it is Christ who climbs down all the way, resurrects us, puts us on his back and carries us up that ladder. Essentially, a Pelagian says that we must do 100% to be saved. A Catholic says you do 50%, Christ does 50%. An Armenian is somewhat better saying that Christ does 99.9999999% of the work, but, you know, we Christians still have to do that 0.000001% of choosing him. As for Lutherans, we say Christ does 100% of the work and we do absolutely zero. Pelagians, Roman Catholics and Arminians all believe that man must and is able to contribute something to his salvation. They believe that man possesses the ability and the free will to contribute something, whether that be works or just the act of choosing God. Man is still able to do something. But all teachings are contrary to Scripture. For instead, we Lutherans, in agreement with Scripture, teach that faith is not the mere knowledge of God. As the Epistle of James says, even the demons believe that God exists and they shudder in fear. Which is interesting, because that is a fear and a faith in God as the judge, which is what the Catholics hold to. Instead, 
We Lutherans believe that saving faith is a belief in God as the Saviour, not as the Judge. For Hebrews 11.1 1 tells it that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the assurance of things not seen. Faith is about trust in God as the Saviour from our sins. Faith is not something that we possess by our own free will. Instead, as St. Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians, faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we are enemies of God, slaves to sin, dead in our trespasses. We cannot choose God, nor can we make a decision for Him. As Jesus said in John 3, 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, those who are natural cannot perceive the things of God. Humans possess a free will, yes, that is true, but those who are born of the flesh cannot perceive that of the spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, your will is bound to sin and you can, no, you can only perform a civil righteousness at best. It is only by the power of God's Holy Spirit that you can perceive the spiritual. You are saved by faith and not by works. This faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit. We cannot, by our own free will, choose to believe in God. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us that we are able to possess a saving faith which takes hold of the grace of God and receives the promises of God. I've been your host, Reverend Jake Zabel. Goodbye and God bless.